Well, good evening, good evening, everyone. I hope that you're doing well. I want to welcome you to the show today. Uh, we're going to have a, this is going to be an exciting show because I have Brother Manuel Fernando Nunez coming on. He's going to be talking about the esoteric side of Freemasonry along with the primitive rites. I'm going to allow him to introduce himself when he gets, when he gets ready to call in. But before that, I just want to welcome everybody that's coming on uh, to today's show. And just to let you know that this particular show, as its totality, the, the whole John G. Jones Research Lodge 147, this is a different atmosphere. You can go, you can go watch any of your other shows. This It seems like everybody trying to be, you know, it's those are good shows. I, I won't knock any of them. But this particular show is just, you know, we're just a little different. We, we you know, we, we come straight forward. You know, we don't try to subjugate anything we, this is this is raw and uncut what you see is what you get um and that's the beauty of the show anyone can call in whether you're a mason or not an eastern star or not whatever your practice may be in in the esoteric realm of things whatever your faith may you can call into the show and we can have that conversation you know because we we want people to understand freemasonry uh, from various points of view. So we want to just welcome everybody that's coming on tonight. And we definitely want you to be part of this show. And if you want to call in, you're certainly welcome to do the, to do that. The number tonight is 619-985-1184. So, you know, we, we just, I just, I just want you to come on and uh, get this show on tonight. Hold on just a second. Brother Greetings, Brother Manuel. How you doing? Uh, greetings on all points of the triangle. Oh yes, sir. I'm just I'm just getting started here, just letting everybody know what the show is going to be about tonight. And I I'm glad to have you on, uh, that you was able to come on, be part of this particular show tonight. Uh, the title of the show is uh, Freemasonry, Brother Manuel Fernando Nunez, Primitive Rights. That's the name of the show tonight. So I'm going to have to have you, sir to introduce yourself to those who are coming on. Why don't you do that for me, can you? Yeah, so um, let me let me talk a little bit about myself, do a little, little bit of a background on me, on who I am presently and how I got there, and um, the discussion of the ancient primitive right. Um, we'll talk about, because there's also, there is another primitive right there is a primitive right that was apparently found in like 1500s. And when you said the primitive right, I was like, I know I've seen that in uh, some documents, but it's the only documents that I've found on this. And they're written in Spanish, and they came from a gentleman named Ricardo Polo, who was a very well known author in secular, progressive, Masonic circles in Mexico. No, I believe he was from Argentina. Mm hmm. But um, his he had an influence all throughout Latin America because it is, anyway. Well, let's that'll be more like first. Let me tell you a little bit about myself, and then we'll talk about because this goes into the, the two different alliances of Freemasonry and why they're pretty much diametrically opposed, even though a lot of people like to pretend that they're not. But um, anyway, so my name is uh, Manuel Fernando Nunez or. Spanish, it would be Manuel Fernando Nunez, right? I mean, that, <laughs> you know, that whole Telemundo voice, right? So, um, I was born in 72, March 20th, 1972, the uh, spring equinox, and um, supposedly we've got some more troubles coming right around the corner on spring equinox, according to my people in Mexico. Um, my people in Mexico, meaning the lodges that we have there in the DF, they, they, they practice a lot of ceremonial magic. Um, and um, they were doing a lot of astrological work, and then they've foreseen a lot of issues coming up in toward the end of March and spring equinox. But anyway, my birth date is March 20th, 1972. Um, I was born in Lima, Peru. Moved to the States at the age of seven. Uh, had a lot of strange experiences as a little kid. A lot of really weird experiences, and that kind of goes hand in hand with my whole um, spiritual evolution toward the uh, Western esoteric tradition, you know. Um, so I, I will talk a little bit about that, if you will. I, um, I mean, how do I mention these 
things without freaking anybody out. So when I was hey, a little look, kid, I- I'm going to say this, brother Manuel. You yeah. don't don't worry about that. Just mention it. Just tell okay. people a little bit about yourself. Just don't even worry about it because this type of show that we do. Uh, just so you yeah. know, we talk about everything. So if somebody's going to get freaked out, that's on them because people need to understand that there's an awakening. <laughs> okay. People need to understand mainstream is bigger than where they at because a lot of people don't understand that. They figure where they at is this is it, and it's not. So having you on uh, the yeah, show tonight okay. can break down some of the, the aspects of esoteric Freemasonry and, and, and primitive All rights. Right. gives people another what? insight on masonry abroad. That's why I got you on tonight. Cool. Cool. All right, so so let's talk about that. Okay, so when I was a little kid, I had some very strange experiences. Um, when I was less than a year old, about nine months of age or so, um, and this is a story that my mother swears on. Okay, like um, that that said serious about. Um, I started losing a lot of weight, and. Uh, Nobody knew what was wrong with me. They had no idea what the hell was wrong. They took me to three or four different doctors. Every doctor told her, oh, he's fine. He's going to be fine. And I just kept losing weight. And I was getting thinner and thinner. And my mom was really worried. And my grandmother was too. And the maid kept telling my mom that they needed to take me to a curandera, which is basically a witch, Mm -hmm. right? And a healing witch, right? Right hand path type healing. Um, and uh, I'm almost like, no, 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 no. You know, I Dios mío, no, you know. Um, but this lady said that somebody had given me the evil eye, which is interesting because the evil eye is, is a tradition that originates in the Mediterranean region, in the Middle East. Um, and I don't know how. It got to Peru unless we're talking about the tapadas and, and this and that. There were there's a tradition um, or legends that the Moors and the uh, the other Muslims who lived in the south of Spain after the Christians took back over and persecuted them and persecuted the Jews and tortured them. You know um, that some of them escaped to the New World and that and that there were some of the Moors and some of the Jews escaped to the New World and um, there, there are signs of this in the way that some of the old houses in Lima and other places were built where, and the women, they said that they used to cover their faces, right? And they used mm-hmm. to use veils, mm-hmm. which of course has never been practiced anywhere in Spain except by, you know, people of Moorish descent, you know, and, and the Muslims that mm-hmm. came on later who were not, because not everybody, not all the Muslims in the, in the south of Spain were, were Moors. At first, the first couple hundred years, it was mostly Moors. And then other people, you know, uh, came in and, and more or less semi-colonized Spain because Spain was a Muslim country for 800 years. But anyway, so we've got that that tradition of the evil eye, apparently, that comes from there. Um, and uh, my mother took me, so my mom takes me to the, the – she, she finally gives in and uh, takes me with the maid and uh, to, like, way outside Lima to the hills – to this little shanty town up in the hills outside Lima. And uh, what happened there was very strange. From what I recall that my mom told me, she said that the woman was blind, completely blind. Um, and they, they had told her what was happening to me. And she said um, that, uh, that I'd been given the evil eye and that... Uh, <laughs> I, I needed to be cleansed. And she didn't ask my mom for any exorbitant fee of money. She said, whatever you want to give me is fine. Um, and she said, I do this because I'm supposed to. So she, she got this little kid and told him to bring her a fresh chicken's egg, a white chicken's egg that had just been hatched like in the morning and I think at the dawn or something like that. It was this whole weird thing and um, and they put me on this table, and they 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 uh, she said that they took off my diapers and they they wiped over me with this white egg, this fresh egg, and it was like a regular egg. And uh, she had prayed over this this like bucket of water, right? And 
then she cracked it. She put it in the bucket of water, and the and the water boiled basically. Um, and vapor came out. Wow! And so my mom was like pretty freaked out. Mm-hmm. But before that, I forgot to mention one part. If my mom told me that it, when the woman was turned around talking to the little boy, I forgot to mention this. My mom had the very intense thought in her head. And she said, there's no way in hell this is going to work. You know, that was going through her mind. Mm-hmm. And as soon as she thought she was thinking that, she didn't say it, she was just thinking it. The woman stopped in mid-sentence while talking to this boy. She says that she turned around and faced her with her blind eyes and basically looked at my mom and said, no, you have to have faith. It is going to work. And she turned back around and she went back to talking to the kid. Wow. Okay. So a lot of weird things. And then, of course, the boiling water and everything. So the woman said, yeah, he definitely has received the evil. I need to keep bringing it back. Um, and she said, whatever you want to pay is fine. She said, if you want to pay a few solids, if you want to pay me, whatever you want to pay me is fine. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do this just for the sake of the boy. So she brought me another two or three times. And each time, the boiling was a little bit less until there was barely any little sweat on the account of And she's like, okay, it's fine now. And... Little by little, after she did this to me, the funny thing is that my mom said that I started healing again. Wow. Okay. So, so that's one of the strange. You go ahead. No. So, so with all that being said, and your background in that, and knowing that this happened to you as a kid, how did you as get? How did, <laughs> how did you? How did you get into Freemasonry? Um. That's that's a long story. That also that see that this whole thing that comes with, make it short, comes keep so it much, sweet. What's that? I said, make it short and keep it sweet. I mean, when I say, how did you get into Freemasonry? The idea is, is that how was you introduced to it? I mean, because people need, first right. of all, people need to know where you're from. It was through my readings in um, on ceremonial magic in the Western Esoteric tradition. It was through readings, uh, you know, on the Rosicrucians by Paul Foster Case and... Um, uh, the Golden Dawn by uh, Israel Regardi. I mean, I, I was introduced into the really esoteric stuff first, right. and the Freemasonry kept popping up. So I was like, "Oh, okay." So I guess that's where I got to go. And I was like, "But I kept seeing." And this was I was mostly reading about this. This started in high school when I was 15 years old. My pursuit of the Western esoteric tradition began when I was like 15. When I was 15 years old, I had a friend who supposedly turned to Satanism. I was very curious. Um, not wanting to go into that stuff at all, but mm-hmm. like, I wonder what the hell, you know, what, why would somebody do that? Or what? So I started reading all these books on, you know, got the, uh, the Avon books version of the, the Necronomicon. And that really confused the hell out of me mm-hmm. because I had been raised in, um, as a child, I was raised in, um, in a moderate, um, uh, Christian Roman Catholic family. Okay. Moderate in the sense that. My grandparents, from my mom's side, mm-hmm. were religious. Funny thing, my grandparents from my dad's side were totally secular. Okay, uh, but my grandparents from my mom's side were deeply religious, but they were not fanatically religious. They were not the type of religious folks that are like, "Oh, we're going to heaven. Everybody else, you're screwed." So, you so- know, which, so what I'm yeah. hearing is that you was already in you had already done a lot of reading on the esoteric side of Freemasonry oh, yeah. before you Absolutely. even gotten it before you was even initiated. So Oh yeah. So, Absolutely. So with Absolutely. That, I with that I being knew the said, rituals of the Golden Dawn. Like I, I at that time when I was like sixteen, seventeen, by the time that I was seventeen years old, I mean I, I knew the essentials of the rituals of the Order of the Golden Dawn. Wow. At least the first four or five rituals, you know, their symbolism, what they taught. And I was familiar with the writings of Aleister Crowley. And, you know, I mean, all of this stuff, I was, you know, was like, you know, the back of my hand. So um, that's how I got started. And I went to military academy for the two years that I was in military academy for my mm-hmm. last two years of high school. I uh, spent a lot of time reading because military academy is kind of like juvenile. It's almost like a prison system. You know, you're kind of, you're called quarters and you're basically, your CQ and you're, you're kind of stuck in your room. Uh-huh. So there's not much to do. So I was, I was just devouring books. Wow. Devouring books and, um, you know, just keep, 
keeping a dream journal and doing a lot of uh, deep meditation. And uh, so I, I... Greetings, I, everybody. I greetings. Most, greetings. Oh, oh, a lot of people coming in to the, to the thing. So, so that was my start was basically that, the Rosicrucians, the Golden Dawn, that kind of thing. And, mm-hmm. and um, you know, and this is like at 16, 17 years of age. And so uh, then I went to, to college, and when I was 19 years old, I was in a class um, on religions of the Near East. And uh, I was friends with this guy, Kevin Cotton, and I, I mean, I, I was acing the class because I'd always gotten great grades in religions and religious studies. It fascinated mm-hmm. me. Comparative religion especially fascinated me. And my, my original major in college, believe it or not, was psychology. But then after three years full time, I, uh, I left college for a couple of years um, to help my mom through a divorce and then went back to school part time. And I switched majors to philosophy with a religious track at George Mason University. Now oh, there are two separate departments. The I philosophy wanna, part of the I wanna, yeah. I'm going to cut you off just for a second, just to ask everyone who's coming in tonight to hit the thumbs up button, hit the like button. And I definitely want to send a big shout out to our brother Victor from Chile just tuning in tonight. Just want to send him a big shout out. I want to oh, send. Victor yeah, yeah, he's online right now. Yeah. He's checking you out. I want to send a big shout That's out to my Jarvis. Yeah, I love that guy. Yeah, yeah. just just want to let everybody know how much we appreciate them tuning in. And uh, right now, oh been, yeah, yeah, uh, Victor's a great guy. He's, he's definitely legit. One of the legit guys out there. Um, some shout outs to Brother Victor Mena, Brother uh, Brian Diapa. Also, hopefully he can tune in. Brother Raymond Edwards, also really good guy. A little controversial. <laughs> 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 I, oh, I love yeah. the guy. I love him. Um, you know, and one thing I love about him is like, like me, he's, he's really feisty, you know? So I, I love that guy. Um, yeah. so, so the question to you right now, uh, brother, uh, Manuel, the question to you right now is people want to know, yeah. that's one of the questions they want to know, are you pract- are you a practicing Scottish Rite, York Rite, Primitive Rite? What's, what's your preference in Freemasonry in your practice? The ancient and primitive rite of Memphis and Mizraim, the 97 degree form, which is the older form uh, of the orders before the Fudosi gatherings from 1934 to 1951. So the 97 degree version of the ancient and primitive rite of Memphis and Mizraim. Now, it's also known as Memphis Mizraim. It's also known as Mizraim Memphis. It's also spelled with an S, spelled with a Z, spelled with the two dots over the I, spelled with one dot over the I. <laughs> depending so, on which lineage. So also they're asking where you're from, your homeland. I was born in Lima, Peru. Okay. In in 1972. I'm going to be 48 in a couple of days on March 20th on the spring equinox. Um, now, to, to get back into then how I came to Freemasonry, right? The, yeah, go so for I'm 19 it. years old. Go back to 19, 19 years of age. I'm in college, um, and I'm in this class on religions of the Near East, and Kevin Cotton and I became friends, and he starts talking to me, and he's like, well, what kind of stuff interests you, you know? So we went out to lunch one day, and I'll remember this lunch. We were talking, and I, I told him about how philosophy and religion, study, you know, interest me. I said, also esoteric study, you know, like um, the Rosicrucians, the Golden Dawn. I said, you know what, I'd, I'd like to find out more about Freemasonry and the Freemasons mm. because they, they keep popping up in all these books that I read. And Kevin looked at me and he goes, "Really?" He goes, "One of our brothers in our fraternity is a Freemason." And I was like, "Oh, really?" And that was the only reason <laughs> that I pledged Chi Phi <laughs> at George Mason University. The only reason I pledged that stupid fraternity was to get close to the brother who was a Freemason, whose name was C.C. C. Cook. Now. I went to like this little, it was a, like a little gathering, Kai-Fi gathering and, uh, you know, get to know people for the, uh, uh, the pledges and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I met CC and we sat down, we talked and we hit it off right away, man. And CC really liked me a lot. And, um, so I figured what the hell, I might as well pledge the fraternity. So I pledged the fraternity, but the reason I pledged it was basically just to get close to CC to get to know him. So, 
like literally two or three days after I had met CC. He, um, shout out to CC Cook, wherever he is. Um, he came by the table where everybody would sit because the pledges had to go to the Kai Fi table. You, you know how it is. Yeah, yeah. You, I, some of us have yeah. pledged. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so I go over there and, uh, and CC goes, Hey, I got to talk to you. He comes over, he grabs me, he goes, I got to talk to you. I go, Okay. So he pulls me aside and he gives me this form and he goes, Here, you got to fill this out. I was like, what the hell is this? So I'm looking at the form, it says order of female late, right? Mm. And he goes, look, you're not 21 yet, so you can't be a Mason, but you can join the order of female late. And I was like, oh, okay, they got to vote on me. And he goes, nah, they normally do that, don't worry, you're in. And I go, what do you mean I'm in? He goes, dude, you're in. I already talked to them, you're in. So you went through like, the demo like first? Was, yeah, okay. but he, had basically, he basically got me in the order. Mm -hmm. he, he got me in to the point that he essentially said, look, I've been a past master counselor at BMLA. I've been in there since I was 14. Um, I'm going in the lodge now. He's, he was at that time, I think he was a fellow craft. Okay. Uh, no, he was an apprentice about to do his fellow craft and then he was going to do his master mason degree. Mm -hmm. said, Look, um, here's the form. You can join the order of the in the meantime. And I said, well, what's this? He goes, it's like the junior masons. And, and there was a lot of the, the symbolism and stuff like that. And of course, their own version of the the simplified story of Jacques de Molay and the Knights Templar, of course, right? Um, and so I joined the Order of the Molay, and just like Cece said, he said that they basically, they, they accepted me right away. My two brothers, my younger brothers, went in the Order also, but they didn't ever go in the lodge. Um, I joined the Order of the Molay. I became very close to a gentleman by the name of Jack Nard, um, and shout out to Jack Nard, wherever he is now. He, he began to teach me more and more about masonry, but... Jack was fascinated with the fact that I knew, he said to somebody once when I was getting initiated as an entered apprentice, he said to somebody once, Manuel knows more about Freemasonry than most of the guys who've been here for 30 or 40 years. Mm. And, and I literally thought he was exaggerating because I had no idea at the level of difference in regular Freemasonry. I had no idea. I thought, oh, this is going to be so cool. This is going to be so great. I'm going to, you know, and um, I went through the first three symbolic degrees and it was kind of cool and weird in a way because I had seen uh, paintings and etchings of the, the degrees, uh -huh. you know, uh, entered apprentice, the fellow craft, the master masons degree. And so it felt like all of a sudden I was inside the painting. It was a very interesting, really? weird experience, right? That's how it felt like to me, like I was the person in the painting now coming to life. So um, it was, th that was a very transformative experience. But in the lodge itself, I mean, I kept bumping into like little issues of um, very subtle and semi-subtle signs of racism. And Jack was one of these people, he, he did not like racism. Mm -hmm. And he did not like anything that was like that. He was a good guy, very good guy. Um, but, uh, you know, he's one of these people who felt that you kind of have to take the organization as it is and hopefully it will improve by putting more and more but, good people in there. But, bro uh, and, Brother Manuel, in this interesting part that you, that you say, See, each of yeah. us who are Masons and Eastern Stars and whatever degree you may have and whatever jurisdiction you may be in, we should all want to find Freemasonry or leave Freemasonry in a better place than where we find it. Because we're yeah. all going to find things in Freemasonry that we like or dislike. But the, but the unique part about Freemasonry is that it, that it claims to unite men of all races and creed. And if this is true, and I believe that it is true, then we should want to leave Freemasonry better than the way we found it. We should want to educate those who are coming on in regards to the true yeah. essence of Freemasonry and its teachings. Now, that's, that's true. You, you're absolutely right. And, and that's where, so, you know, I, when I went through these degrees, I kind of heard a little bit about co-Freemasonry as they called it, but, you know, 
they made it sound like it was these little groups of people. Nobody's really a part of that. It's just a fringe group. You know, nobody ever sat down and said to me, hey, you know that in this country, it's only about 1% of Freemasonry, but in France, it's actually like 80% of Freemasonry, and through most of continental Europe, it makes up about 60 to 70% of Freemasonry, mm -hmm. and in Latin America, it makes up 60 to 70% Freemasonry, percent of the Freemasonry, and most of Africa and most of the Caribbean, most of the lodges are not our Freemasonry, they're the other progressive kind of Freemasonry, that co-Freemasonry stuff that we dog in this country, in most parts of the world, it's the bigger kind of Freemasonry. Nobody ever said that to me. Nobody, of course. Wait, wait, you know, wait. Wait, 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 hold up. You need to repeat yeah, that again yeah. because a lot of people can't, they can't fathom that. You need to repeat that yeah, again I in know. regards to co-Freemasonry. Okay, so, so essentially there are, there are two completely distinct, different, and opposite alliances of Freemasonry. So when people say, well, Freemasonry does this and that, which alliance are you talking about? And if, I mean... Because they're completely opposite. One alliance is all about uh, liberty, fraternity, equality, you know? And the other alliance is not. Uh, the regular Freemasonry, it's, a, its agenda, as I've come to understand it, and this has been through many, many years of both introspection, reflecting on everything that I've been through, and studying it, and reading it, the agenda of regular Freemasonry is a very imperialistic, um, very misogynistic, somewhat racist, especially in the United States of America. It's definitely in the United States of America. It's, it's a tradition that is filled with racism. Mm. Definitely. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. I mean, just look up Prince Hall Freemasonry. That says it all right there. Why do black men have their own order of masonry? Because of racism. Does it still exist? Hell yes, it still exists. And what does that tell you? You know? So, this idea, like, like that article that I told you about the other day that I saw with this, this, this young black man who had joined a lodge in, I believe it was Georgia or Florida, I don't know, I can't remember. But he joined, I think it was Georgia, and they were talking about uh, you know, Freemasonry descends from the Enlightenment. And remember how I told you they tend to be really slick? Yes. And they word it in such a way that, they, well, yeah, some Freemasonry descends from the Enlightenment. That's the true uh, statement. Some Freemasonry descends from the Enlightenment. It's not the regular Anglo-American Freemasonry, though. It's not that one. I, that you know what? You know what? You need to repeat that again because I keep saying the same thing in regards to Anglo-Saxon Freemasonry and what you would consider enlightened Freemason. You, you, you. Yeah, I would, I would say, I would definitely say that American regular Freemasonry does not descend from the Enlightenment at all. Um, Anglo-American Freemasonry descends from a very white Anglo-Saxon Protestant centralist idea. Um, and, uh, and this is why in this country, almost all the lodges, with the exception of that half dozen lodges in Louisiana and that one district that are uh, ancient accepted Scottish Rite lodges, but with that exception, 99.999% .999 of the regular lodges in this country are York Rite symbolic lodges. But they mislead um, the average Freemason because they don't teach him, they don't say, oh, this is the symbolic lodge, and we follow the symbolic lodge according to the York Rite. They don't teach them any of that. They just say, this is the blue lodge. <laughs> These are the blue lodge dudes. Yeah, you know? teach, brother, That's what teach. They're taught. That's what they're taught, right? And right? it's not the way it is, but that's the, 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 the blue lodge. No, it's not the blue lodge, dude. Nobody ever called, in the other countries, nobody calls it the blue lodge. The only time they call it the blue lodge is because they want to dumb it down for Americans. Because Americans don't understand Freemasonry. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, oh, oh. Hold on, brother. Time out. Time out. Rewind. Oh, my God. Oh, I had to call a time out like that. There's a, a flavoring file on that one, brother. You got to repeat that. You say, oh, my God. I got to tell it like it is, right? So That's that show. Americans... 
Americans do not understand Freemasonry. The funny thing is American Masons understand Freemasonry less than most non-Masons, especially, you know, like people who are not Masons, but they're initiates, say in the Rosicrucian Order or the Golden Dawn or uh, whichever the lineage is, or Ordo Templiorites, or uh-huh. these, uh, or the uh, Paul Foster's uh, two orders, or any, uh, Paul Foster Cases two orders, or any of these uh, esoteric orders, they know a lot more about the real Freemasonry than 99.999% Ooh. of regular Masons. Ooh. And that is the I'm, I'm just that saying, bro. You're throwing some bombs you know, out there. You, you know I'm throwing the truth. Now, most regular Masons, as I said, they don't understand the idea that, see, uh, here's here's how Freemasonry really works, okay? Each rite of Freemasonry is a school of Freemasonry. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. And every single rite has its own version of the initiation rituals for the first degree which is known in English as the Entered Apprentice Degree, and in other nations it's simply known as the Apprentice Degree. The second degree, which is known as the Fellow Craft Degree, which is a shortening of Fellow of the Craft, because we're lazy, and so we like to just say Fellow Craft. It's originally known as the Companion Degree, and in in Spanish it's called the Compañero, and in in, in French it's called Compañon, which basically means what? Companion. Mm -hmm. And in the third degree, the Master Mason's degree, every single rite has its own distinct version of those rituals, and they are different, one rite to the next. So, the York rite is the most simplistic, non-esoteric rite in all of Freemasonry, in my own humble opinion. And that is specifically the right that is used, not even non-esoteric, I would call it anti-esoteric. I would call it an anti-esoteric right, mm. and that is the foundation that they give regular Freemasonry. Because it's not meant as an illuministic system. It's, if anything, it's an anti-illuministic system. They dumb it down as much as possible. And, and you can tell, because the York right doesn't have a master of ceremonies position. Mm-hmm. The Master of Ceremonies in the ancient accepted Scottish Rite, symbolic degrees, and in the ancient primitive Rite degrees, right? Uh-huh. The ancient primitive Rite won't be certainly, because the Rite of Mizraim has slightly different names for the officers and everything. It's, it's, it's a little bit, bit different, but, you know, I don't even want to get into that because that's going to throw people off. No, you so can't do it. Don't stop now. Time. But, um, but the ancient primitive Rite of Memphis, okay, and the ancient and primitive rite, uh, and the ancient accepted Scottish rite, are both esoteric rites. Uh-huh. And I believe the folk rite also, I have to review the rituals. I have not read the rituals for the French rite in quite some time. But uh, I, I have to confess, the French modern rite, but I believe the French rite also has master ceremonies. Don't quote me on that, though, okay? Mm-hmm. So um, let me, I will have to look over that again, because I do have the French modern rite degrees, but I need to look over them again. Um, but in the esoteric uh, rites, there is a master of ceremonies. And see, Americans don't understand the ancient except the Scottish rite. They don't. Wait, 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 wait a minute. First you said that they don't practice true masonry because they, they, they no. thumb it down. Now you're telling me that yeah. they don't practice the ancient except the Scottish rite properly? No, of oh. course not. <laughs> Well, that's because, it, I mean, it's very obvious from the fact that the first three degrees are never done in the ancient accepted Scottish Rite. Not only that, but they don't even, the average American Freemason, if you ask them, I guarantee you, you ask a dozen American regular Masons, you, and you say, what is the name of the ritual monitor written by Albert Pike that showcases the rituals, the first three rituals of the Entered Apprentice, Fellow Crafter Companion, and Master Mason's degrees, according to the ancient accepted Scottish Rite, most of these poor idiots would say morals and dogma. Okay? Yeah, that's true. That's what they would say. But what it is, it's called The Porch in the Middle Chamber. The Porch in the Middle Chamber is a book, and anybody who's listening to the show can look it up. This is the ritual monitor that has the detailed um, instructions 
on the initiation rituals of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite. And I know that the rituals are done in a certain way because I was the master of ceremonies for an ancient and accepted Scottish Rite Lodge in Los Angeles under what was at that time an order called the Gran Logia Hispana de Norte America, which I joined much later, and we'll get into that a little bit. So we're jumping all over the place here, but it's because... No, you know, no, you're doing just fine. You, you, you're right on time. <laughs> we're kind of bouncing back and forth depending on themes, but to, to get into the thing about the rights again, okay, so the York right is a very simplistic right. It's not meant to illuminate people. And so people go into the York right and they learn this very naked ease. It's kind of like the learning in the York right as compared to learning in the ancient accepted Scottish right. And once again, when I say the ancient accepted Scottish right, I'm not talking about the fourth or thirty second degrees. I'm talking about the ancient accepted Scottish right in the first three degrees, which most Freemasons have never seen. In this country, most American Masons have never seen. Most of them don't even know it exists. Mm. What they're taught, this is what they're taught. What they're taught is this is what they're taught literally from the, 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 the from the, the, the from regular Masons. This is what they believe. They will say. The Scottish Rite is not a Masonic body. <laughs> it is a body dependent to Freemasonry. And it controls the 4th to the 33rd degrees. This is the idiocy that they are taught. You you know what? You know what? And you're right. I didn't learn that. I'm telling you, I'm a past Grandmaster of State. I had to go back and relearn some things. Particularly exactly. for myself and for my jurisdiction. Because what I had been given and taught... I found Come later on. after visiting different uh, 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 lodges, foreign lodges, look, we'll be behind. Man, this is I, the oh, yeah. oratory and those, it, it, it was just different. See, yeah, it's like, I mean, Anglo-American regular Freemasonry, and, and by that we also include Prince Hall. Sorry, guys. But yes, Prince Hall, you guys are part of this too, which is shameful because you're actually giving money to the United Grand Lodge of England, which is buddy buddies with all of those people who have treated your people like crap for 300 years. So, you know, what what are you doing? I don't know, but you're giving money to the enemy for whatever reason, I don't know, you know? But don't pay attention to me. Just go to Lodge and just keep doing your dues. And, you know, a part of them always go back to Mother England and supporting all that. Um, but anyway, oh uh, yeah, don't even get me started on that. So, to me, regular Freemasonry is like the McDonald's of Freemasonry. And when I say that, I literally mean it. Like, if, if, if somebody were to say to you, like, imagine that you were to say to somebody, okay, um, I, I'm going to go get a burger at Five Guys. And imagine a person looking at you going, Five Guys? No, you shouldn't get a burger at Five Guys. That's not a regular burger. You go, it's not. No, it's an irregular burger. It's a clandestine <laughs> burger. It's an irregular burger. You have to go get a burger at McDonald's. Mm. And you go, well, why? And the guy goes, because McDonald's has served over 52 billion people. They were the first ones that instituted franchises. They know burgers. I mean, if it's not a burger that comes wow. from McDonald's, it's not a regular burger. I mean, and this is literally the kind of crap that they pull with people. Mm. And they're like, oh, it's not a regular order of Freemasonry. Because look at all the beautiful buildings that we have and all the fancy duds that we have. We don't know what the hell we're doing, but we have a lot of fancy stuff, so come believe us, you know? The emperor really has no clothes. Mm. That's the truth, and people don't realize that. Regular Freemasonry is a sham. I will come out and say it. Regular Freemasonry is a sham. I'll say it again. <laughs> it is. You can say it it's on this show. Club. It's a so well, I'm going to say it on this show. It's a social club made for men, mostly older men, who want to get away from their wives. Oh! Exactly I didn't see that is. one coming. <laughs> That's all it is in this country. It's a social club for men who want to spend time away from their wives. Dang. This whole thing about, like, oh, Manly Palmer Hall and Albert Pike, dude, you ain't Manly Palmer Hall. You don't have anybody in your lodge, anybody in your grand lodge that even resembles Manly Palmer Hall hmm. in knowledge or in, in his way of doing things. So please, don't even don't even go there with, oh, well, Albert Pike. Albert Pike, first of all, was a racist, okay? He knew a lot of stuff, yes, okay? But his best jewels in morals and dogma 
came straight out of a lifeless levy. What? Which was the pen of Alphonse Louis Constant. Wait a minute. Okay? Go back and say it again. Oh, his, his best writing I'm came out of what? I'm going to take it there. Okay. <laughs> Albert Pike's best stuff was pretty, and you can look this up and you'll find it. It was copied from Alphonse Louis Constant, whose really? pen name was Elias Levy. Yeah. Yeah. Pike knew a lot. Okay. I'm not going to say the man sounds wrong. He spoke, I don't know how many languages. He was, he was definitely a, a true, um, a, a true initiate. He was a true initiate. Okay. I'm not going to, Deny that. Right, 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 right. But he was also quite a bit of a plagiarist. Okay. And uh, yeah, racist, too. Okay, <laughs> okay. Know? Yeah, he was, people try to downplay it like crazy. Though, like, well, he was a Confederate general, and uh, that was uh, a lot of them were racist back then. Dude, your boy was a racist. Okay? <laughs> Let's just call it what it is. Okay? He was a racist. Man. Done. <laughs> okay. But he was a knowledgeable racist, though. Okay. I mean, that, that I have to admit, he, he, he was an initiate. Um, and uh, anyway, so the, the ancient accepted Scottish, right, the degrees, the way they're supposed to be done, is the, um, the entered apprentice degree. This is the interesting thing. The first 33 degrees of the ancient primitive rite of Memphis, which are also the, the first 33 degrees of the ancient primitive rite of Memphis and Mizraim, because Memphis and Mizraim, or Memphis Mizraim, or Mizraim Memphis, again, mm -hmm. depending on lineage. Um, it's basically degrees 1 through 86 are Memphis, and then 87 to 90 come from Mizraim. Oh, okay, okay. And then 91 to whatever the hell, 95 in most cases. In some cases, some orders have developed the rituals for the 96 and 97 degree, and then the ones that went through Fidosi have developed all these, and sometimes, you know. Uh, hey, hey, know, hey, Brother Manuel. Them. Brother Manuel, yeah. uh, 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 someone just posted. Let me go back. This brother just posted. Light Traveler said, I disagree that, Mason, that Masons use masonry to escape their wives. I'm going to have to agree <laughs> on your side because I've seen some things. I'm just saying. Yeah, that's what that's what the brother posted. He said he disagreed with the fact that Masons use masonry to escape their wives. And, I, and I'm well, going to agree with what you said because of what I've seen for myself. Here's the thing, okay? Um, the bromance that is Anglo-American for masonry, okay? That the little, so the happy sausage party, right? With all the men just coming together. Um, I mean, if it isn't guys trying to get away from their wives and their girlfriends, I mean, what else is it? You know, it's like, well, I mean, it is what it is. You can disagree. Maybe you don't, you know, oh, I'm a member of the Lodge because whatever. I honestly have been manipulated and brainwashed to believe that what they're teaching you really does make a difference. Um, or maybe... I don't know. You go to Lodge because, well, there's a few really good brothers in there that have become really good friends, and I go there to hang out with them. Whatever. You know? Maybe you're like that, but I guarantee you right now, and remember, I was first initiated fast and raised in a regular Lodge. So, yeah. I think it's the same <laughs> thing that most Masons are doing it to get away from their wives and girlfriends. Okay? Because, it, you know, if, if it was a mixed lodge, it wouldn't be like that, right? If it was a mixed lodge with men and women, right? And, and that's the thing that, and here's the other thing that also, I think it's funny, because I've talked to, to brothers that want to do esoteric freemasonry, and they want to start esoteric lodges, but they don't want to bring in the women, you mm. know? And they'll be like, they'll be like, why? You know, they'll be like, oh, no, see, you don't understand, brother. Like when we do a project with the Eastern Star Sisters, you know, they start taking over everything. Well, that's because women are smarter and more organized. Whoa. Yeah, well, see, well, huh. I mean, if we bring them Brother that? Manuel, Brother Manuel, yeah. let me tell you, let me, I, I, I had, you are so right on that point. Let me tell you why. I went to, <laughs> I, I went to, I went to, uh, last year, I went to visit uh, the public installation of the female Freemason 
Grand Lodge in California. They first coming online last year. So I got the invitation from the Grand Master State. And I went. Nice. And I will tell you this. Everything those sisters did was on point. From the lighting of the incense to the stage to the, 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 the yep. uh, it was, it was amazing. I mean, because it was so, I don't, dignified or is that even a, a way to frame it? But it was so, it was beautiful, man. It was yep. beautiful. And, and it was different in, in the sense of the lighting of the incense and the oils and the, the esoteric position that they brought into the uh into the lodge and how they was man it was it was different than the way the brothers do it it was it was I, I, people can say i shouldn't have been there but let me tell you who was there at this particular uh uh public installation there was members of the california grand lodge officers past masters were there watching this thing also so when when people was jumping down my throat i'm like man you should have been there to see that Brother, let me tell you what it's, it's a public installation. It's a public installation. It's not a and and the reason they go there is to, to spy because because the, here's the truth when when it's the right kind of person that goes into the lodge and by the right kind of person I mean somebody who's actually pursuing um to you know dig a, a tomb for his vices and to become a better person, become more evolved, and you know he's actually seeking esoteric knowledge and whatnot. That kind of person is in for a huge letdown. Mm. Okay, there's no way in hell that you go through this simplistic thing, you know, in the lodge, and especially in a white majority lodge, and you just keep bumping left and right into racists. Mm. Okay, because I don't care what lodge you get to. There was at Alexander Watson Lodge number twenty-two. Let me tell you something. When I went through the degrees, it was what it was ninety-three. I was twenty-one years of age. Um. Jack Nard at that time told me that there had been one member who was a black member, and I can't remember the gentleman's name, but when he had originally petitioned the lodge... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Old. Go back, go back. What year was this? Um, I was. I went in in 1993, and this gentleman had already been initiated a few years previous. Was, was it here so in California it, or where about? No, Alexander Washington Lodge, number 22 oh, okay. in, uh, in Alexandria, Virginia. Okay. Okay. Now, this brother had been initiated probably late 80s, I'm guessing, maybe a year or two before me. I don't know, but sometime before me. And um, he was blackballed. Wow. And uh, the Grand Master of Virginia at that time, and Jack was very proud of this, as I said. Jack was a really, really good guy. Jack Kennard is a really good guy, not a racist at all very much opposed to this kind of thinking, okay? Um, and he was very proud of the fact that the Grand Master of Virginia at the time had gotten notice of this and basically put out a message through the officers of the lodge at Alexander Washington Lodge number 22. He said, look, I want to speak to whoever blackballed this man because I've looked over his back. I think he was a professor at George Washington University or something, and I believe he was like ex-military or something, but basically he was a guy who had no criminal record, had a great job, you know, paid his taxes, everything, exactly who you'd want as a member of the lodge, mm -hmm. right? And and he said, I don't see a reason why this man should be excluded from the lodge, and I want to talk to whoever was the black belt him, because so help me God, if the you excluded him from the lodge happens to be his race and not some legitimate reason that you know of in the past, like some kind of immorality that he's done at some point in time in the past, mm -hmm. then, you know, we're going to have to have some words, you know? Um, and nobody ever came forward. Nobody ever had the guts to come forward and say, I blackballed him because of this. Because they wow. knew. They knew they blackballed him because of that. And, and then, so the Grand Master of Virginia said, okay, so I'm overriding that vote, and he's he's making his way into the lodge. So so he was accepted in the lodge. Now, that being said, here's, here's my perspective on this. Why the hell would you want to join a social club where you've got people there that are ready to hate you simply because of your race? I've said that too. I've said that over and over again. 
always go where you're welcome, not where you're just tolerated. Go where you're exactly. appreciated and respected. I mean, go ahead, brother. Yeah. Anyway, so, so years later, I still remember that. Um, and I remember when he said it, he shocked me. And, and I think Jack told me about that. And he said, you know, when I said, well, why? That, I said, how do you feel about it? He said, it, it's wrong. He said, it's wrong, man. Well, he goes, I, 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 I don't, I, he said, I, I'm not a racist. I, I don't like racists. Um, and he said, and unfortunately some of the brothers, you know, they're ignorant in that way. And, uh, you know, he, he said what most people say, you know, like, unfortunately you have to tolerate it because they're your brothers and this and that. He said, but I don't agree with it and I don't like it. Um, and see, that's where at, at this point in time in my life, I break with that. I'm like, no, if I don't like that, if, if that thinking is in some way, shape, or form immoral or unjust, I'm not going to tolerate it at all. Right. You know, and, and, and that's one of the things that was beautiful about forming my own order, but we're going to get into that. So anyway, let's, let's get into, go back a little bit of time to then the next year I went, after I finished the law, I went through the lodge degrees when I was 21. At 21 years of age, 1993, went through the lodge degrees, Alexandria, Washington Lodge, number 22, in Alexandria, Virginia. It's supposedly considered the most prestigious lodge in the country, was George Washington's lodge. That's the lodge that was initiated into. Um, and uh, I went through those degrees. The following year, I went through the so-called higher degrees of the ancient accepted Scottish right. It's two crash weekends, right? It's two, it's like you do like the fourth to the 20th degree one weekend, then you do the 21st to the 32nd degree the next weekend. You're sitting there and, and, and you're not really initiated in anything. You, you basically sit down and you watch some joker uh, do a reenactment of the initiation for about maybe a third of the degrees. Right, like the fourth, I think it's like the fourth, seventh, ninth, fourteenth, eighteenth. Wait a minute, go back. You said there's really not an initiation. Right. Oh snap! I wish they'd have told me that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the the ancient accepted Scottish right, the very handicapped ancient accepted Scottish right, right, because there's no foundation. You don't even have any feet. So how can you walk without feet, right? Because your first three degrees are totally missing. And n nobody gives these poor bastards, and this is the funny thing, in the porch in <laughs> the middle chamber, this is, in the porch in the middle chamber, hear me out, the porch in the middle chamber, the second paragraph in the introduction, Pike even talks about how the book should be read by brothers who were initiated in other systems, you know, and he's talking about the so-called blue lots, so, you know, the York right, symbolic uh -huh. lots, the blue lot, you know, so that he could understand the first three degrees before being accepted into the higher degrees of the ancient accepted Scottish right. Because, see, the first degree teaches you uh, it, it's, it's a Gnostic baptism and you're going through the alchemical elements. The second degree teaches you esoteric philosophy. The third degree, the Master Mason's degree, not only teaches you about the birth and rebirth of Hirama Bip, but it links and kind of strongly hints that Hirama Bip is linked to Osiris, right? You don't get any of that. Ooh, you don't get ooh, any of that. Oh, yeah. You hit no, you, you, bro, you, you, uh, uh. you don't get any of that in the, in the York right. You don't get any of that. The York right is just very simple, like, eh, hey, the hammer symbolizes this. <laughs> it compasses this. The ruler is this. You know, that's all you do. It's very, very simple. It's made, it's it's like the difference between teaching a 12-year-old a little mini guidebook on astronomy versus an actual college textbook on astronomy. Wow. You know? And and that is the difference in in education between I one system, between the York Rite system and the ancient accepted Scottish Rite system. I have a and question. The ancient primitive right of Memphis was rain system. Because the ancient primitive right of Memphis for the first three degrees, they're about 90, the first 33 degrees are about 95% the same. 
Now, the ancient primitive rite of Memphis, it is a little bit more esoteric. There is a little bit more symbolism. There is a little bit more teaching, but not that much. Um, and in the very first degree, the inter apprentice degree, the order of the elements is uh, in the ancient and primitive rite of Memphis mm-hmm. uh, and Memphis Mizraim. It's earth, water, wind, fire. Um, okay. In okay. The, and the French degree, the ancient accepted Scottish right, it's earth, wind, water, fire. The wind and the water reverse. Why they reverse? Not a hundred percent sure. I'm guessing, and this is my own guess, but I could be completely off. Um, I'm guessing. I, I imagine Pike. Pike was probably initiated into other systems as well. He was probably a Rosicrucian, a Kabbalist. He, all these things. You know what? He was initiated to Rosicrucian. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he was. Yes. Because he knew about all these things way more than... So, in the Rosicrucian grades, um, and you will learn this if you read, like, Israel regarding the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, right? If you look at the, the, the first four grades, right, before the Adeptus Minor mm-hmm. grade, which is where the Master Masons degree really comes from, the Adeptus Minor degree of the Rosicrucians... Um, and the, the post Rosicrucians, like the Golden Dawn system and stuff, which is basically where, at that fifth degree, the five equals six degree, you become Osiris, dead and reborn, right? And that's where the Master Mason's degree comes from. Um, but of course, you know, huh, you can't teach this to good regular Masons, no. Hey, because, you, I you, mean, you, know, w- w- you you've said a lot, but I want to recap on some things that you've said. In regards to the yeah. golden dawn, uh, dawn. Yeah. Uh, why is it that you think that most Masons in America doesn't see the other rights of Freemasonry or the other rights of esoteric part of Freemasonry something of regularity? Why is that? Because I know that when I mention these different rights, people are like that's that's clandestine. What What's your opinion about that? Uh, my opinion is they're idiots, but that's just me. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. In regular Freemasonry, there's this brainwashing process that goes on. Um, it's a very, very subtle brainwashing process. And to deprogram yourself from it takes a while, takes a lot of meditation, a lot of introspection, um, a lot of prayer, possibly, uh, and just... The ability to be, I, I had previously deprogrammed myself, and I don't want to offend anybody, but I had previously deprogrammed myself from Christianity. Um, and that was on account of my, my studies in religious studies, where I basically became convinced after many of my studies, I was like, Jesus literally had nothing to do with Christianity. He was a Jew, he, he worshipped in synagogues, you know, all the apostles were Jews, you know, I mean, it goes on and on and on. And you're like, okay, and all of these are pagan fees, there's this trinity, nowhere in the New Testament. You know, I mean, it, it's, and then you look at the New Testament, you're like, man, it's most of the New Testament is these letters from St. Paul, right? Mm-hmm. Saul of Tarsus, a man who never knew Jesus. <laughs> a man, who never, a man Jesus. who never knew Jesus, huh? Writing them letters. A man who never met Jesus. Uh-huh. Literally. And, yeah, and then he came. And after he persecuted, and here's the other funny thing, a man who persecuted the Nazarene Jews, and they misleadingly will tell you that he persecuted the Christians, except there was no such thing as Christianity. It didn't exist until much, much later, because there was no such thing as Christianity until after St. Paul or Saul of Tarsus, because he was the first one that used the term Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So... He was the first one that even used that term to describe Jesus. Mind you, a Greek term, right? Uh-huh. A Greek term. You know, Greco-Roman, paganism, hello. But anyway, um, and, and we were talking about who, a man who was a Roman citizen, right? A Roman citizen. So, which means what? He was a pagan. Yes. Because okay? they sure as well wouldn't give citizenship to a Jew, even though he says that his mother's line came from the Jews and everything. Yeah, maybe she did. But she sure as hell wasn't a practicing Jew. Mm. You know, couldn't have been. Being born out in the colonies in Tarsus in Syria, and you're a Roman citizen, that, that means you were a practicing Roman citizen, meaning you were a pagan. Okay? Very simple. So you're talking about a pagan who was persecuting Jews, who then arrives on the scene and tells them all that he's a part of them. Peter and 
James, the brother of Jesus, are looking at him like, I don't know, I don't know about this guy. You know, then they finally initiate him, and of course, many years later, you know, um, we know that in the history of Paul and Peter that they had a parting of, of ways. They did. And they had a mincing of words. Their very last meeting was not a friendly one. Uh -huh. This is well known. You can research it yourself. And and Peter, who is Peter? Jesus' best friend. Who is James, the brother of Jesus? The brother of Jesus. Who is Paul? A dude who never knew him. Okay? <laughs> that's simple. I mean, that's how it is. That's how it is. Let's tell it how it is, okay? So people want to go to church, and that's fine. You know, I mean, if it makes you feel better and makes you a better person, all that, that's fine. But, you know, and, and I, 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 you know, I'm like, man, people can believe whatever they want. But if somebody says to me, well, Jesus taught Christianity, that's where I have to be like, actually, no, he didn't. He never did. He, he, he taught Judaism. And, he, and even in the New Testament, you can even find that, that, that one verse that says, I came not to abolish the law, but to strengthen the law. What does that tell you? Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, well, it, it tells me that you shouldn't, you shouldn't be eating bacon on Sundays after church is what it tells me, but whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we I do. Mean, I mean, hey, small, that, you know, even for myself, I, I would say this. I just call it like it is. Say again? So, so, I said, I just call it like it is, you know? And, and, I um, can, and I can say this even for myself. When we were talking about deprogramming or anything like that, yeah. being, I, I'm brought up in, in Bible Belt, Mississippi, three oh. times on Sundays, church Hallelujah. meetings, all of that. So think about me <laughs> and how I had yeah. to come out of that for myself, you know, and, and actually educate my kids. Like, let's go get you some soap food. Grandma's old, let's go get you some soap food. Man, it, it, it took me a minute. It took me a minute I to know. get to where I'm at. I, I it wasn't an overnight proce process. I'll tell too. you that. I'm telling you, somebody like me, it took me a while. You know, I remember one of the first, one of the biggest turning points was a question that I asked one of my professors, Dr. J.D. Burns. I don't know if he's still alive. But um, I I went to his office one time and I knocked on him and I said, well, Dr. Burns, I need to ask you something. He said, what is it, Manuel? He, he was a Scotsman, so he's like, oh, what is it I have? You know, <laughs> it's Scottish accent. But um, I said to him, look, the, the followers of Jesus, did they really see him as like the son of God, like God incarnate? Or did they see him more as the prophet of God? Because from my understanding, I said the Messiah is the anointed one, which implies an anointed prophet. Mm -hmm. And this idea of the Christ is like this different concept that comes from St. Paul, who didn't even really know him. And Dr. Burns was like, look, man, I don't want to affect your faith. And I was like, um, it's, look, my faith is already pretty much out the door. I just want, I'm just looking for the historical facts, you know? Right. And uh, he said that some people probably saw him as a prophet of God, and maybe some people saw him as being, you know, God incarnate. But I think he was trying to basically tell me, you know, that it was, he was, he, he didn't want to go there, you know? But my conclusion is like, yeah, I mean, the Messiah is it's the prophet of God. You know, there's no, this whole thing of God incarnate, that comes from the, um, you know, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed and, and, you know, and, and, and these creeds came about much, much later. And, uh, you know, they, they, they literally, if you look at it, the creeds make no sense at all whatsoever. Well, you know, I, I, I know coming up in a Presbyterian church after, after I left Mississippi, being a Baptist missionary, coming to California and, and, and joining a Presbyterian church, you know, learning the Apostle Creed and then learning that after that you get into the Knights Temple, you find the Apostle Creed. I'm like, dang. Yeah, you know, I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah, that whole God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten, not made. It's that, that begotten, not made. That's where you should take a little moment of pause and think about that. Begotten, not made. Yeah. That means, you know, that literally means what you're telling people is that you're saying that God had sex with Mary. It's literally what you're telling people. Begotten. What does it mean to beget? It means yep. that she was impregnated. Yep. You know? And people don't think about that. They go, no, no, that's not what it means. You're like, no, yes, that is what it that's means. That's what it means. So what we don't, it's 
what we don't dare say, but it's what it means. Because people don't you go know? look at the words, you know, because word has meaning and they just, they don't look at the root of the yeah, word. Yeah. They just, you know, get it for what it is. And, and that's what I mean by deprogramming. So I had, I had deprogrammed myself. My point is basically that I had gone through a deprogramming, pre deprogramming already from Christianity, and it had actually taken me at first into um, Thelema. I left Christianity, and I actually became a part of uh, Alistair Crowley's Order of Templi Orientis, and I was a member of OTO for four years. Um, and uh, while I was in OTO, I began to research Sufism more. And I'd always been fascinated by the Muslims and by Sufism since the time that I was very young, since the time that I had first seen a picture of Mecca and the mm -hmm. Kaaba in Mecca. And it impressed me. It was in the National Geographic book because I used to read a lot of National Geographic books as a kid. My uncle Alfredo used to always send me these big books and atlases and all kinds of stuff. And so, um, yeah, I remember five years of age, the first thought that I had when I read the little caption on the bottom of this photo of Mecca and the Kaaba and everything was, a, you know, the city where only Muslims can enter. And I was like, oh, they have their own secret city, you know? <laughs> and, and, you know, as five years old, that's, that locked into my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, fast forward to about 25 years of age, and um, I had also fallen in love with this Muslim girl from Egypt. I'm not going to mention her name because I don't know if she's married, divorced now, but we had a very haram, very forbidden relationship, you know, a sexual relationship. About a year and a half, and I was totally in love with her. And for the first time, it began to consider, because I had also been reading about Sufism and the Muslims and everything, I, was, I started considering, you know, conversion to Islam. And even after we broke off and... I was still considering it then, and, and I had a very interesting experience, conversion experience, but that's that's for another discussion, for another day. Um, anyway, I I was a practicing Muslim for 15 years of my life, uh, and um, after Thalema came Islam, and I was involved with the, uh, the Muslim faith for 15 years of my life, and I was a practicing Muslim. I, I fasted, I prayed, I was initiated into three different Sufi orders, the wow. Nimatullahi order, the Shadali order, and the Qadri Rifai order. The Nimatullahi order under Sheikh Kashani of the Nimatullahi order in D.C., the Shadali order under Sheikh Nu Hamim Keller, um, and the um, Qadri Rifai order under Sheikh Tan Ransari. I joined each one, one of those orders at different periods in time during my 15 years as a Muslim. Um, during that time, also my first year, I also got a chance to go to Morocco. I took leave from my first Sheikh, Sheikh Kishani, and I went to Morocco to study at the Qadawiyan at the most ancient university on earth, literally, um, with uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, or known as Hamza Yusuf Hansen in some circles. Mm -hmm. So I was part of Hamza Yusuf's circle of um, you know students and business students for a number of years, and um, I still know some of those folks um and i'm in touch with some of them good people he's a very good man um i know he sometimes rubs people the wrong way because he's he, he he tends to say things like he, he tends to say what he feels and sometimes mm -hmm. he says a little too much too fast too soon mm -hmm. and then he gets told by people um but he definitely has his heart in the right place and he, he's a true initiate also He's a true initiate. He's definitely been initiated in the... People are like, oh, well, Hamza's a Sufi, but most people can't say what order he comes from. I know the first order that he was initiated into was Sheikh Al-Qadr al-Murabit al-Sufi's order, known mm -hmm. as the Murabitun. That was his first order. He was one of the 13 original disciples or students or murids of Sheikh Al-Qadr in England. Another one of his original students was... Um, my old friend Daniel of Ohio Moore, who passed away a few years ago of cancer. Um, and he was uh, a really good guy. Uh, who uh, I remember one time he read some of my poems and he gave me back his feedback on it because he was a poet and a writer. And he said, dude, you're really good. You should publish it. 
Do, do you think that uh, Masons uh, here in America uh, yeah. really can 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 get a grip on the the essence of Freemasonry? I mean, regardless of jurisdictions or ancient Freemason oh, accepted <laughs> or Prince Hall or any of them, do you do you think they're capable of grabbing that? Um, most regular Masons, no. Um, no. I think most of them, no. I, th I think most regular Masons would first have to deprogram themselves, and that would be very hard to do. It was hard for me, and I had already deprogrammed myself from Christianity, but it was hard for me, and I remember when I went through it was in California many years later, when I, and the way that I came into Irregular progressive Freemasonry is very, very interesting because um, it was one of the brothers that had been my Dervish brother in the last order, and the order was Sheikh Tamad Ansari, Brant Smith. Mm -hmm. um, and Brant had a falling out with the order, and uh, I don't know if he told off, I don't think he ever told off the Sheikh, but he had a falling out with the order. And Sheikh Tamid Ansari basically told us, leave Brand alone, don't talk to him, because he's just going through his thing, we give him his space, whatever. And so we, we listened, and, and I, I didn't talk to him. And I felt horrible about it. You know, how, you, know you get these remorses. And later on, I, I left the Kavadi Five Order, and um, and then years later, you know, at this point I was still a practicing Muslim, and um, I'm married at this point. I was in a very unhappy marriage. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't want. No, no, you don't have to talk about that one. You you can let that one go. Good, but uh, I began to look for my old friend Brand Smith, right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, and it's weird when when uh, synchronicity happens, right? All these things were happening at once. I was looking at uh, Brant, and I was trying to get in, uh, in, involved with the lodge out because I was like, one of the things that hit me in, um, in 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 Virginia here, we went on a trip to Boston. And I'm not going to tell the whole story. It's another long story for another time. But basically, I had a face-to-face -face encounter with racism, really bad racism in Freemasonry. And the woman who was saying all these horrible racist things ended up being the wife of a past master of Alexandra Washington Lodge Number 22. Wow. And that hit me so hard. I was like, this horrible human being is married to a past master from the Lodge. There's no way in hell that this guy thinks too differently from his wife, otherwise he wouldn't have married her. Mm. And so that means that the past master of this lodge is a blatant racist also. Wow. And, and okay. it started to me thinking, and I started, I started, I, I basically started pulling a fade out to the lodge. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? Like I went to the lodge like one time the next month, and then kind of like didn't go for a couple months, and then I didn't go for three months, and I kind of like never went again. Okay, so yeah. my next my next question to you before we get ready to uh, to close the show out tonight, as we proceed a little bit farther, but my, how did you you left you left what you would call a regular mainstream jurisdiction, right? Oh yeah. Okay, so once you okay. leave there, why? No, no, no. I understand why you left, but once you leave, and and yeah. you and once you I left, I focused on. On uh, other esoteric uh, streams, I focused in Ordo Templi Orientis, and that's where I started going into more into Sufism and focusing on that esoteric stream. Uh, and um, when I was in California, it wasn't until I was in California and I was married, and uh, I wanted to get involved with the lodge out there because I had heard that in California, people were a lot more open-minded, and maybe I can find a lodge where there's no racism and everything. And the, reason, the way that I got into the whole progressive Masonic thing is that I was trying to track my friend Brant Smith down and I started looking for him online and uh, looking up his name 
in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I found him tied to a lodge that was part of this Grand Orient USA. I don't know if you remember when the Grand Orient USA was yes. around. Um, and so I was like, what? Grand Orient USA? What is this? And I started reading it, you know, and of course, at, at this time, I, I found the, the information on the, on the order, and I was like, oh, oh my God, Branson and Irregular Grand Lodge. You know, <laughs> what is he doing? That is clandestine Freemasonry. That is irregular. That's not real Freemasonry. Uh-huh. You know? That was my thinking. And so I started to investigate it. And the more that I investigated, I just took a huge dive down down the rabbit hole. And at the same time, I had also reestablished contact with a former friend who had been in Ordo Templi RNTs for some time, Tall Alan Greenfield. Shout out to Tall Alan Greenfield, who was is my consecrator. He's the one who gave me the charter for my order. Uh, but Tall Alan Greenfield had left Ordo Templi RNTs and he was working with um, with with a stream of the ancient and primitive rite of Memphis in his reign, right? Uh-huh. And and so I was in contact with Tall Allen, and I was researching the ancient and primitive rite, um, which of course there's almost nothing in public channels in English about the ancient primitive rite. You know, if if you really really unless you happen to get your hands on some of the documents from Grand College of Rites, which I have now, yay. But anyway, <laughs> um, most of the stuff is in English and, and French, uh, excuse me, Spanish and French, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, so, uh, and in other languages from Eastern Europe also, and Western Europe as well. And so um, I started tracking down Brandt, and uh, then I started, the more I started learning about the ancient primitive rite of Memphis and Israel and about progressive Freemasonry and everything, I, I realized that, like, oh, my God, this, this ancient primitive rite of Memphis and Israel, this is this is bigger in, in the progressive Masonic. It, it's not accepted in regular. It's part of this irregular Freemasonry. And it started puzzling me. I was like, why is it that there's all these things saying that just there's, they were, I thought all of these um, pages saying that John Yarker, for example, was never a real Freemason and this and that. Why wasn't he a real Freemason? Because he wasn't a regular Mason because the Mem- right of Memphis and Memphis and Ms. Rain were not regular Masonic rights and all this and that. You, and I was you, like, you, oh. I'm going to share this, this with one. you. So the yeah. prim- so what we call primitive rights and esoteric Freemasonry, what I've learned yeah. from a guy that comes on that comes on here, his name is uh, the Traveling Man, all right? He says that Regular Masons call that college Freemasonry. It's, it's like a college. It's separate from uh, uh, the Grand Lodge system of things, but they call it a college. And I was telling him that you can call it what you want to call it. I've looked at your page and I see that a lot of mainstream Freemasons uh, somewhat uh, uh, get involved with what we call primitive rites. I don't know how they teach it or anything, but from what, that's from what I see. It's actually called the ancient primitive right because the primitive right is the right that began in the 1500s. The primitive okay. right is a right that began in the 1500s. was a secular right. I have some documents on it in Spanish. Um, I'll see if I can get them translated for you and sent to you because they're from Ricardo Polo, as I was mentioning earlier in the show. Mm-hmm. And he was very, very knowledgeable, very secular, and I believe he was an agnostic Freemason in, mm-hmm. in, uh, in Latin America. And uh, he... You know, the, the Mexican right, if I'm correct, Mexican right uh, is like the French right, very secular. Um, but let me go back a little bit into this because I wanted to blow the lid on something. The Grand College of Rights. I'm uh, listening. Those guys. The Grand College of Rights, okay? Here's the truth about the happy little Grand College of Rights. Um, what's his name? Um, on, but what's his name? The guy who translated the book by Robert M. Blen, um on Martinism, and he translated Piers Vaughn. Piers Vaughn, that's right. Piers Vaughn and Arturo Leoyo and all these happy guys in the Grand College of Rites, they're all 95th degree initiates of the ancient primitive rite of Memphis and Mizraim. Mm. Okay? They were initiated to the high degrees by um, Ronnie... What the hell was his name? Uh, give me a second. Let me see if I can look it up real quick. Um, Ron Ronald. It was an Italian 
Italian name. I remember that. Um, give me one second. Okay. So while you do that, I'm going to make a brief announcement real quick. For those of you who are tuning on tonight, okay. I have uh, brother Manuel Fernando on tonight, and he's just breaking down some knowledge in regards to Freemasonry from a whole nother point of view. Uh, if you want to pose a question, please do hit the chat line and, you know, ask your questions. And if he see it, I'm quite sure he'll be able to get a hold to it before we close out tonight's show. So, first of all, I want to welcome okay. everybody for tuning in, and I hope that you are enjoying the show. Got the name. It's a, it's Ron Capello. So, Ronnie Capello was a I've heard of that. I've heard of that name. The, yeah, he was a member of the Grand College of Rights, and... um. I was discussing with one brother, I don't want to mention his name outright because I don't know if, if I should or not, but uh, he's one of the other Grand Hierophants or one of the lineages. Uh -huh. um, and uh, he mentioned to me that he thought that quite possibly Ron Capello, and this would make total sense because the Americans don't really know the esoteric side of Freemasonry and all the, the, the linked orders. They don't know the real truth about Martinism, uh, the L.U. Cohen. Very, very few of them really have an idea of that. And the ones in the Grand College of Rights, what they were doing is they were basically pussy, pussy footing on both sides of the fence. Okay. So Ronnie Capello, what he did was he was a member of the Grand College of Rights, right? And Ronnie Capello basically got a charter to start a lineage of the ancient primitive right of Memphis, Missouri, in this country. And then he supposedly officially, quote unquote, left regular Freemasonry. And yet, funny thing, haha, we find that in the books translated by Pierce Vaughn, right, of Robert M. Boulin, Robert M. Boulin, who was a very well-known esoteric Freemason from France, right, from these irregular orders, right? right? How did Pierce Vaughn put his hands on these books by Robert M. Boulin? Well, we find in the thank you list, Ron Capello, okay? Mm. Ron Capello. Because what happened, and I've got, and I've heard it from three or four people who used to be members of the Grand Union, so I know exactly what happened. Okay, Ron Capello basically got the lineage from France. He started uh, his lineage of the ancient primitive right of Methodist Missouri, and then he got all his buddies in the Grand College of Rights initiated. Okay, so all those guys are a bunch of hypocrites. Ooh. Okay, they're a bunch of they're a bunch of filthy hypocrites. Mm. Okay, they're a bunch of filthy hypocrites. I will say it again, because while they went around in public saying, yeah, this is an irregular right, nobody should practice it, you shouldn't practice it, no, 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 very bad, don't practice it. You can read the rituals, right? The Grand College right told you these yes, are Yes, you can, you can read the rituals. But you can't practice, you shouldn't practice. These guys, wow. meanwhile, let me tell you, let me right tell you. Now, getting, initiated, getting initiated into these degrees and partaking in rituals with mixed lodges, because unfortunately, and I will say this also, many of the progressive orders of Freemasonry are suckers, and they will allow these regular Masons to come and go as they please. Yep. Even though they will never be invited back to their own lodges, which is ridiculous. That's like if I came over to your house, and then after dinner, you said to me, hey, brother, you know, that was, we had a lot of fun. Listen, next time maybe we'll do it in your house. And if I said to you, you know what? Uh, Tony, I really love coming over to your house, but you can't ever set foot in my house. No. But you know what? I'm more than happy to keep coming back to your house and eating your food whenever the hell I want. Mm. And if you said to me, sure, Manuel, that sounds great. You know, <laughs> that's, basically, that's basically, you know, with no exaggeration, that's basically what all these progressive orders of Freemasonry do in this country. Mm. And then they wonder why they don't grow. And then they wonder why they don't spread. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, the lodges in Los Angeles for the, uh, the, the the George Washington Union, it's shrinking. In the 50 or 60 years it's been in this country, they've only grown by two or three lodges. And only because the two or three lodges from the Grand Orient USA joined them. And only through the help of my buddy, David Tamayo. Shout out to David, by the way. Okay, That's why they grew. Because they don't know how to spread. Because the French are very progressive when it comes to everything except spreading, okay? Uh -huh. That's the one thing they're not progressive on. They're like, oh no, when we initiate you, it's gonna be a year. 
before you get your companion degree. And then it's going to be a year before you get your master masons degree. And then it's going to be a year before you can go into the higher degrees. And then, oh, wait, where did everybody go? Nobody wants to be in the shade anymore. What happened? <laughs> got you. And, got you. And add to that, add to that the fact that when these regular masons come and they knock on the door, they're like, oh, yeah, come on in, come on in. And what do you think the regular Masons think when, check this out, nobody ever sits down and says to them, your Freemasonry has this totally different agenda. Mm. Your Freemasonry has an agenda that basically, you know, supports the royal family of England, supports a status quo that is unjust, keeps the rich in their place and the poor in their place. Well, how does it do that? Because it doesn't allow you to discuss politics and religion in Lodge. It sure and doesn't. Not alone. It says that. It actually says that. It says yeah. that religion and politics shouldn't be discussed in lodge. But what I've learned, exactly. what I've learned is that, especially in, in over in, uh, um, I want to say Puerto Rico, France. In, in France, and look, man, you're gonna have this discussion. Yeah, you're gonna have the discussion. It's, it's an open discussion, and and it's an open discussion without prejudice and without rudeness. Nobody yells at each other. Nobody curses anybody out. Nobody says horrible things. But it's a very open discussion with very serious people. Bring up their facts, their concerns, and then one person will stand up and raise the hand, and the master will recognize that person, and that person will speak, and then the next person will speak, and then the person and the questions are asked back and forth. And there's this whole philosophical debate that takes place the way of old, you know, like true real philosophy and real debates and real understanding because there's a search for truth, a truth without borders, a truth without censorship. You know, if there's a self-censorship in the sense that you censor yourself from cursing and yelling and, you know, bickering with someone, but you're allowed to talk about anything you damn well please because you're searching for truth. Mm. And that is the way you arrive at truth, not by placing borders around it, like, oh, we can talk about anything, except for, because when you start telling people you can't talk about anything that borders on politics or religion, what does that take out? That takes out everything that deals with society yes. on an important level. So you can't talk about the economy. You can't talk about laws that are unfair or unjust. You can't talk about social justice. You can't talk about any of these things because all of a sudden, like they slam that wall through. No, 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 that's politics and religion. You can't talk about that. You can't talk about you know boys getting raped in in uh, you know by priests. You can't talk about you know the problem between Jews and Muslims. You can't talk about problems in the Muslim community. You can't talk about any of these things. Well, um, you, you know what? I, I have just a cut. I got about two or three minutes left. And oh, you kidding me. You no, bro. You know, I got to have you back. I got to have you back on the show. I, I really got to okay. have you back because we can go all night. But really, I only got, I got a couple of few more minutes left. And uh, I'm going to have to go go off, log off for, you know, for the night. But we coming back. I got to have you back. Now, you got to let me know when you want to okay. come back, though. Well, what, when's the next time you're doing the show, man? Well, you know what? It'll be this weekend. I say, uh, you want to make it for Friday? Sure. All right, I'll then I have you back on Friday. Now, I'm, I'm writing down I'll, some of the I'll, questions I'll, that I'll, people I'll are asking. Out there we have, people want me back. What are the people saying? Oh, people man. Saying? They, they, they want to talk about <laughs> they want to talk about the difference between the Scottish and the Egyptians uh, oh, in regards yeah. to the degrees and structure. I had somebody oh, asking yeah, something yeah, about yeah, Sufi. Yeah, we can, I would love to get into that. I would love to get it. Let's, let's, you know, um, let's get into next time. Let, let's talk about the history. I'll give a brief overview of the history of the ancient primitive right. Uh -huh. And, um, uh, and then we'll talk about, you know, the links between the ancient primitive right, Memphis, Mizraim, and Rosicrucianism and Martinism and, you know, these, uh, other esoteric systems. Yeah. Um, because, yeah. You, you know, yeah, as you man. have, as as you so have, excellently done tonight. You have proven that masonry is bigger than where you're at. You have you have, you have, you have definitely broken down different structures and frictions in in the whole skimmage of Freemasonry, and and I, I like it. I mean, I've enjoyed just listening to you myself. So definitely, I gotta have you come back on and just really break off some more knowledge because this is something that a probably a lot of brothers don't get in their lodge meetings. They don't have these type of conversations. I know I can personally say I do because my, I'm, I'm going to tell you, my meeting last Friday, we had our meeting Friday. My wishful master yeah. came in. No, my, my my past master. He's he's a past master of another lodge came in. 
and he was offered to open up. So he came in and he went he went through an esoteric opening of the lodge. Well, most of us had never seen it. And he's he's into the esoteric side of he's like, look, before we open the what we call the regular way, I want to I want to show you this esoteric way of opening. So he lit the stage. He lit he lit incense. He said the Arabic prayer. He went around and took uh, he took some water or some sort and he dropped it in every corner. But every corner he dropped it in. He said a little some some. Then he came back. He had he took uh, I want to say wine or some type of beverage. You know, took it and he blew it to the four winds. Each corner represented something, and he he, he said what it represented. It was pretty angels, interesting. The four the archangels, the four archangels. Yes. That, that all comes from a you know ceremonial magical practice because as you get to the higher degrees, the eighty seventh and ninety eighth degrees, these are the introductions to ceremonial magic. Although by that time you've also been initiated in the inner orders, you know. So the inner orders would include the Martinist order, the L.U. Cohen, and in some cases, in other cases, sometimes some of the or depending on what order, some orders have the the inner orders as as the the Rosicrucian orders. But essentially, the ancient primitive rite of Memphis in this reign has been, it's it's not the sign of Freemasonry being the be-all, end-all. It's kind of like the, 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 the Freemasonry is like the outer gateway, the set of outer gateways. All the degrees are outer gateways to inner orders, to inner orders that teach mysticism and ceremonial magic. There you go. Okay. I, I'm going to leave it at That's that because you got to come back and talk about that ceremonial right. magic. You got you to come right. back and talk about that. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that then Friday then. Yes, Sarah, that's going to be the All topic right. of the Peace. show. Is going to be ceremonial magic. Oh, boy. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, I got it. Yeah, yeah. We're going to drop ancient, it like it's hot. Let's make it the ancient and primitive rite and, the, and, the, and its inner orders. Okay? Yes. But the, the thing is, the inner orders, I don't, I mean, oh, my God. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. What oh, else? yeah, All most right. definitely, most definitely. <laughs> so... I'm going to get ready to log off for the night. I hope everybody has gotten some from this show tonight. I'm going to have Brother Mooney, uh, Brother Manuel Dude, coming yeah. back on, and he's going to be dropping some knowledge. I mean, it, it is what it is, and I, and I, and I, I love his energy. And definitely, as always, I tell people all the time, st stay out the bushes and keep the light on. So as we close out tonight, <laughs> that's what oh, I want to tell you. You know? Just to, to, to reiterate real quick, because people will want to know, well, well, who is he? What? So I am the Sovereign Grandmaster and Grand Hierophant of the International Order of Kinetic Gnosis and Illuminism, which is a Masonic order for men and women that uses the ancient primitive rite of Memphis and his reign and contains certain inner orders that I normally don't talk about too much in public, but I guess I'm going to have to talk about a little bit in the next show. Um... Uh, that's about it. That, yeah, now. that's about you know, it. Cause you don't want to give away too much. No, no, I don't. But if you can, uh, you know, if, if you want, I'll uh, I'll pass on to you. I'll text you the uh, the website so that if you want to share it with people, if they want to seek some more information on a website, you're more than welcome to do so. Certainly, certainly will. So everybody, please be careful. Be safe. I hope that your families yeah. are well, and you know, just take care of each other wherever you may be at. Peace. Stay away from people that are coughing. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Peace to everybody. And whatever you do, always stay out the bushes and keep your light on. Thank you, Brother Manuel, yeah. and I appreciate you. Most welcome. God bless. Take care, man. Blessings. Fraternal, yeah, fraternal goodbyes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Fraternal embrace.